Well, thank you all for uh, taking time out of your schedule today to listen to this presentation uh, on the history of the St. Bernard as a rescue dog. I am a pet lover. I don't happen to have any dogs, but you'll find out later my connection to this topic um, and this majestic, wonderful breed. So you see here before you not only a picture of a St. Bernard, but a uh, 1982 issue from Romania showing the St. Bernard. This was a this was a stamp designed by Jugen Pallade, and it was a set of of uh, working dogs on stamps, and the St. Bernard is a part of that classification. Now, we have a blank screen. You have a blank screen. This says you are sharing your screen. I can see the screen. Yeah, 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 I'm screen see fine. yeah. So, so most of you can see it. I, I apologize yes. to the person who cannot. I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, what you see here, uh, is a 1970 first day cover. Uh, this is a, a cover of German stamps that uh, featured first responders, rescuers, and across the top, Freiwillige Hilfsdienste means voluntary service. Mm -hmm. And so this was a, uh, a cover denoting the voluntary service of others of people who help people. Uh, you see some of these stamps featuring a mountain rescue, water rescue, and so on. Uh, but I was captivated by the cachet and that beautiful, majestic dog uh, in this mountain landscape behind it. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things where it had no connection to anything I collect that did not stop me. I bought it. And so it started a small collection of stamps. Hmm. And here is why I'd like to introduce you to Brenda. I did not own Brenda, but Brenda was a dog that my aunt and uncle owned and showed at dog shows. But for me, I a young child, uh, I would go visit them. And here was this giant dog as big as I was and just beautiful and friendly and soft and I loved it. And so I saw that cover and it, all the memories of Brenda sort of flooded back. And I thought, wow, oh, I wonder how many other St. Bernard's on stamps there might be. So what was my next stop? The uh, American Topical Association checklists. And of course there is a checklist on St. Bernard's. As a matter of fact, ATA offers more than 1,600 different checklists, many categories of dogs and cats and other things. Uh, and so I found the St. Bernard's checklist and that gave me a place to start. Um, this list, and I haven't uh, asked it to be updated, so I'm sure there are more, uh, but in 2020, this checklist contained 49 different St. Bernard stamps. And this is uh, one of the stamps on that checklist. This is actually the first St. Bernard stamp uh, that appeared. And this is a 1964 Bulgarian uh, issue that featured, as you can see, a series of uh, different dog breeds, but it included this St. Bernard. So I thought, well, I better get that. And I, I bought that set and pretty soon I was working my way through finding other St. Bernard's on stamps. And this is just a smattering of some of the ones that I've collected, a, a Romanian stamp on the left, on the right from Nicaragua. And this German stamp in the center from 1966 is a semi-postal. And the extra funds raised by that particular St. Bernard stamp uh, went to benefit the German Youth Stamp Foundation. So I, I really like that. And then I found a set that began my thinking in a different direction about St. Bernard's. And this series of Albanian stamps from 1966 showed different dogs. And you can see that next to each dog is a vignette or scenario 
that would be appropriate to that particular breed. And I've uh, enlarged the St. Bernard stamp. And you can see in this vignette that in the very front here is the St. Bernard in the foreground who has uh, located uh, a person who needs rescuing uh, for the rescuers, the human rescuers who are in the background here. But the dog is able to get to that person first, which is immediate comfort. I've been found. Somebody's going to help me. And so, uh, so this stamp began my thinking about St. Bernard's, not just as a working dog uh, in that particular classification, um, not just as a pet, but as a uh, helper of humans. Here is a specimen uh, satanic uh, set from uh, Mongolia. Uh, this is a 1978 stamp. Uh, once again, featuring a vignette, as you can see here, of the St. Bernard in a mountain setting. And although it's difficult to see because uh, the, the specimen marking across the front obscures it slightly, it's a, a little better, uh, easier to see down here on the bottom stamp. Here is a person laying in the snow and the dog has found that person. Uh, there's a real history. I started digging into the history of how the St. Bernard became known as this rescuer of people. And that history actually goes back quite a ways. Uh, and the origin is the human St. Bernard, St. Bernard of Menthon. And this was a, a, a Catholic uh, priest who felt drawn to service of people in the Swiss Alps, and especially to travelers in that area. And he is uh, commemorated on this uh, Monaco Red Cross maxi card uh, issued in 1974. And the image on the stamp, as you can see, uh, represents what you see in the color image, uh, not identical, but very similar. Here is a person with a lantern and a the St. Bernard at, uh, at his feet. This is a, a St. Bernard of Menthon and his dog uh, rescuing a person in need. Uh, St. Bernard, of course, in Switzerland is well known and is commemorated to this day. Uh, here is a statue uh, at, in the area of the Alps where he was known to work uh, in uh, 10, about 1050. Uh, and there is a particular pass now called the Grand St. Bernard Pass named for him because this was where he essentially set up shop. In 1050, he founded a hostel uh, at the highest point of this pass. And that site now bears his name. And this uh, postcard shows you the, the statue that has been placed there to honor him. Uh, the stamp, uh, this stamp came later from Switzerland uh, commemorating, this was 1989 for the issue of this particular stamp. And it commemorated the bimillennium of the Grand St. Bernard Pass and the naming of that pass for St. Bernard of Menthon. So who was this man? Here, here is a obviously no, no photography, as we have well learned in a, a previous presentation in uh, 1050. But uh, ar this artist rendition uh, gives us uh, a feel of the man in his surroundings of course, with the dog at his side and the Alps in the background. Um, he's a person who for 40 years roamed Northern Italy and Southern Switzerland. This was the area of his service. Uh, his goal was to visit, visit every mountainside village. And he listened to travelers. There were lots of travelers between those areas. They would travel over the Alps to get to friends or family on the other side. 
uh, or traveling for pleasure or hiking and that kind of thing. But it could be very dangerous, of course. The Alps are quite high. And so he uh, heard stories of many different travelers, people who were lost in the mountains, who suffered uh, injuries due to frostbite, uh, were ambushed by robbers, uh, some perished it on the journey, and his heart went out to those travelers. And so he made it his life's work to help them. This particular postcard uh, depicts the uh, Alps in, the, in that area of, uh, of Switzerland. And you can see I've circled here uh, where the Grand St. Bernard Pass is uh, on the range. This is uh, a pass that is an uh, elevation of about 8,100 feet or tw about 2,500 meters. Uh, and it was very treacherous for travel uh, travelers. Uh, three quarters of the year, there is snow. And in winter, very heavy snow, uh, 10 meters deep uh, in, in the dead of winter with temps, uh, temper, um, temperatures uh, as low as minus 29 Celsius, very, very, very cold. So the pass is snow covered most of the time. And uh, he was there to help people who still had to get through that pass regardless of those conditions. Now, uh, through history, of course, he isn't the only one who traveled the pass. Uh, Napoleon is one of those famous uh, travelers. Uh, in the case of Napoleon, uh, as you can see from this postcard depicting his visit to the uh, hospice that was established there in the pass, uh, Napoleon was uh, in 1800, he was there um, leading his troops through the Alps because he had, and he was on his way to Italy. He'd taken power in France through a coup, and now he was working to reinforce troops, so he was traveling to find more people to help him. And you can see in this postcard, there's the trusty St. Bernard uh, checking him out. Another one on the stoop up here. Uh, they were part of, of the hospice, certainly. Um, this airmail stamp uh, from uh, United Arab Emirates from 1970 also commemorates that trek. And I have down below here uh, the artwork that uh, inspired the, the art on the particular stamp. Um, this was a French painting um, in the early 1800s. Uh, the painter was Jacques-Louis David. And uh, you can see that that they this painting certainly was the impetus for the art on that particular stamp. Now let's take a look at that hospice. Here, this postcard shows you the hospice itself, the Hospice Grand St. Bernard. Um, and it was uh, right at the pass and it became the way station for travelers where they could rest, uh, get food and water um, and where they were brought if they were injured or robbed or needed help. Um, and it for many years served travelers in need, uh, including those who were just hikers and just needed a place to, to stop and refresh themselves. I included this um, poster stamp. This is a German poster stamp. And although it doesn't have a uh, St. Bernard dog on it, uh, it is indicative of um, the early, well, this is more of a, a early 1900s uh, hikers gear. This particular stamp promotes specialty tourist clothing and, of course, the Alps in the background. And I, I liked the feeling of what it might look like with uh, people trying to uh, get over that mountain pass uh, as a as an exercise of uh, health or as a need to travel to visit others. That hospice was very important. You can see from this 1928 postcard on the left, the hospice is centered 
in the the valley uh, leading to the St. Bernard Pass. Of course, this is summertime, so this is one of those few months. Uh, this was taken in one of the few months where there was no snow, uh, but that was pretty pretty rare sight. What I loved about this was the cancel you see here. This is the reverse of this postcard, and the uh, hospice, uh, Grand St. Bernard, has its uh, logo mark as part of uh, next to the cancel uh, on that stamp, uh, and I really liked uh, that connection to the hospice itself. Uh, what you see on the right is a monk and his uh, dogs. His uh, uh, this is an Augustinian monk and uh, on the mountain rescuing or uh, surveying. Uh, you'll notice that these dogs. Uh, do not look like the fluffy uh, St. Bernard that I showed you in the original picture uh, as we began. And we'll tell the, I'll tell the story of how this dog breed began. Um, but you will see that this version here on this particular trade card looks a lot rougher, a lot, a lot less fluffier, uh, more rugged. This is a... Uh, uh, first day cover from uh, the UK in uh, 2008, featuring to promote its uh, feature its stamps on working dogs. And although there was no stamp with a St. Bernard on it, the cachet and the cancel, which I really love, uh, did feature a St. Bernard. Now, the St. Bernard is part of the classification call, uh, called the working dogs. And what uh, identifies, the, the characteristics that identify dogs in the working group are dogs that are uh, highly intelligent, they are quick to learn, they're alert, and they're very watchful and powerful. Uh, they are essentially bred to assist humans. And so they excel at certain kinds of jobs where they get a chance to do that. For example, guarding property or pulling sleds or water rescues and the like. Now, what you see in the bottom right is the English Mastiff, another very beautiful dog. And you can see many similarities, especially in the facial features, the shape of the nose and, and uh, mouth. And that this, this English Mastiff was the beginning of the St. Bernard breed that we know today. So in the early versions of the St. Bernard dog named for St. Bernard of Menthin, the, uh, the Mastiff was mixed with other breeds to develop a very rugged, strong, faithful dog who would, uh, who, whose rough and tumble abilities, its strength, a uh, very muscular dog was a good companion to help rescue others. And so the Mastiff was the beginning of the St. Bernard that we know today. Now, many of, you can see the difference in this early trade card on the left versus the real picture postcard on the right, uh, where we see uh, St. Bernard's looking more like the St. Bernard we know now. That's how they are. They were depicted uh, through, even though history doesn't bear out their, their early use looking like that. You can see that on the right, uh, this uh, these dogs uh, of Grand St. Bernard Pass uh, rescuing an avalanche victim, it says down here in the bottom. Um, and you see dogs that are sh shorter haired, uh, more muscular. And so the, the dog of the early uh, St. Bernard's were more like this dog, very helpful to the humans who needed their assistance. There is a very famous St. Bernard, and this is him. His name is Barry. I should say his name was Barry. He was a legendary rescuer, uh, credited uh, for 40 rescues out of the total 200 that had uh, 
200 rescues that had taken place out of the hospice. He was a prolific rescuer. He was born in 1800 and he, his, uh, um, his prowess and his uh, ability became well known and his tale got told uh, over and over again. And so uh, he was revered, not only by the monks, but by the people he saved and later by the people who lived in the area. And so uh, you can see uh, that his legend lives on in this, um, here's a, uh, a sample of a label for a cheese wedge that also shows a St. Bernard and it's got his name, Barry, underneath. Um, Bear, while Barry did pass away, uh, his human owners wanted to make sure that the honor uh, that he deserved would continue. And so after his death at age 14, he was preserved through taxidermy. And he is now part of an exhibit at the Natural History Museum in Bern, Switzerland, uh, which I think is pretty cool. I have not seen it for myself, but it's on the list. Now, here's a little quiz. So you'll have to unmute yourself to answer this. You'll notice St. Bernard's depicted in these various stamps that I show here from Argentina, Turks and Caicos, Monaco. Uh, I love this personalized stamp from Japan. Um, and so you see these different stamps all featuring St. Bernard's. What is one feature that they all have in common? The barrel around the neck. That is absolutely right. The dogs in each, uh, depicted in each of these stamps is carrying a cask, allegedly a cask of brandy. We see lots of pictures of St. Bernard's with casks around them. There's all sorts of promotion. I am here to tell you today that that is a myth. It is a total myth and I'm going to bust it. So here's how that myth began. This is a painting uh, painted in 1820 by uh, an English painter, Edwin Landseer, and this is called Alpine Mastiffs Reanimating a Distressed Traveler. It's really a lovely painting. Um, this young British artist, he was only 17 when he painted this work, and he had never been to Switzerland. However, he had seen for the first time a St. Bernard dog who came to England during some sort of promotional tour. And at that time, young Landseer saw this beautiful dog and heard the stories of the rescue attempts in the Alps and the rugged conditions and the part that these dogs played in helping others. And it was the catalyst for him for this idea of a painting. And he went back and painted this beautiful work. And um, the painting gained notoriety and people began to associate St. Bernard's and their rescue feats not only with this painting, but with the image this painting presented. Because as you can see, it does depict two St. Bernards. They are here uh, with this distressed traveler, uh, looking this one on the right, looking up probably to his handlers to say, okay, I found him, let's get him some help. You'll notice the dog on the left, uh, in great with great attention to the distressed traveler uh sniffing the the traveler's hand maybe offering comfort but here it is around that dog's neck that cask totally made up by this artist didn't have anything to do with uh reality uh as a matter of fact there are no records whatsoever of saint bernard's in uh the swiss alps carrying a cask around their necks. Um, the Bernard St. Bernard hospice monks ha uh, denied that that ever took place. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've spoken to physicians who say that the last thing you'd want to give this person in this condition is a shot of brandy. So, uh, but 
why let a good myth go to waste? And what happened is not only did the painting gain notoriety, but you know, liquor dealers saw this as a great opportunity to promote their own product. And here's an example of Hennessy Cognac Brandy and an ad you see on the left featuring a St. Bernard with a cask on it. And of course that cask has their product name on it. They even uh, had cast this porcelain figure. These figures were uh, displayed on uh, in bars, commercial bars and what have you, uh, featuring the Cognac, Hennessy Cognac name and continually perpetuating the myth of that cask uh, carrying St. Bernard. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's become such a mainstay that even in touristy promotions of Switzerland, you'll still see photos of St. Bernard's with casks around their necks because, you know, if you don't, you can't beat them, join them is kind of how it goes. It's what people expect to see and nobody really argues anymore. But the truth is, it wasn't really a thing. Now, what happened to St. Bernard Pass? Well, the Swiss built a tunnel between uh, Switzerland and, uh, and Italy so that people didn't have to travel over the Alps to get to the next country. And this stamp was issued by Switzerland in 1964 uh, to commemorate the tunnel, the completion of that tunnel. This postcard shows different views of the tunnel, its location, uh, what it looks like at the toll booth. Yes, you can now even take your Winnebago across the Alps by going through this tunnel. And of course, the requisite St. Bernard's here in the bottom right corner of this postcard. And yes, that one's got a cask around his neck. You're just never gonna get away from it. But now you know it isn't real. It's just a thing made up by a young British artist in 1800. So uh, I'd like to finish uh, today's story by being telling you how thankful I am for this wonderful, magnificent dog that is not only, that I knew not only as a wonderful pet and companion, but as a dog who helps other people and that it's part of its DNA to do so. As a result, it seems only right that we humans could return the favor. This is Daisy. Daisy is a 121 pound St. Bernard and she was rescued in Northwest England in 2020. Uh, she'd been on a long hike with her owners in the steep hills well, they just got the best of her and uh, she suffered an injury on her leg. And because she was so showing signs of pain, she just couldn't go on. Her owners didn't want to push her. And so they were able to connect with rescuers and they kept her well hydrated and plied with doggy treats uh, while they waited for the rescuers to come. Um, fortunately, uh, the 16 team members of the Wasdale Mountain Rescue Team located the travelers and Daisy. It took five hours and these 16 people to get Daisy back to help, but uh, you can tell that she is very grateful and we are grateful for dogs like Daisy. That's Thank it. You. Thank you, Michelle, that was, um, that was superb. Um, I particularly like the way you had placed the um, almost one after the other, uh, the picture of the um, um, the card of the uh, what did you call it the the clothing uh, for walking over over the pass just after you mentioned it can get to minus twenty nine and ten foot of snow. I thought the the clothing was a little optimistic for those conditions. I thought <laughs> I think so too. But you know, this is the fun about thematic looks mm. at at topics you begin to think about other elements that were going on and how do I help tell the story? 
And I love poster stamps. I'm a sucker for poster stamps. <laughs> I saw great. that one and I thought, okay, I'm just going to get that one because that's a nice fit in here. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, does anybody have any, any any questions, thoughts, comments for uh, uh, for Michelle? Help me make it better. I'd appreciate your thoughts. Ooh. Oh, Wendy. Are you muted still? You're muted, my dear. Oh, darn it. Sorry. It's okay. Is there anywhere in the States where these dogs are used? In any of your mountainous areas in the States? You know, that is an excellent question. Um, we don't, I don't know of any in particular, but now I'm going to have to research that so I can answer your question. <laughs> um, you know, the, I think part of, of what we see these days is that technology has surpassed the abilities of humans and animals in so many instances. For example, we don't really need draft horses to pull a plow anymore because we have these wonderful tractors that are now internet connected and everything else, right? So, um, so it doesn't mean that we don't, we certainly do use rescue dogs. Uh, often the rescue dogs we see in the US are Belgian, uh, um, and German, German Shepherds, the Belgian Malinois, um, a, a very Shepherd-like, uh, German Shepherd-like dog. And they uh, are the ones that are often doing the search and rescue. But we also see a variety of dogs used in the States and throughout the world, trained for a variety of other ways to serve, uh, including drug sniffing dogs, dogs that can uh, sense, uh, there are even um, service dogs who can have a, who, who are so sensitive to certain kinds of scents uh, being uh, emanating from humans that they can uh, alert yeah. their uh, person that they're about to have a seizure or other instances. Uh, I was really distressed. First, I was very, very happy to learn as uh, you're probably aware of the uh, the international story of those four children, uh, it, you know, in the Amazon jungles yeah. rescued, and they used a Belgian, I believe it was a Malinois, in the search. But what and and they were rescued and we're all happy about that. And I didn't learn until just yesterday that the dog is still missing. Yeah, and so it's been missing for two weeks, and they. Yeah. They have uh, they have promised us that they will not stop looking for that dog, and people are putting signs up in their windows to honor Wilson, the name of the dog. But um, you know, these dogs give their all, and sometimes they don't survive the efforts that they uh, that they offer. It's really kind of sad, and yet we, I mean. The, the dog helped find those kids. They'd still be looking if it wasn't for the. That but dog. it's interesting that nowadays, then it wouldn't have been wearing some sort of satnap thing on it because they it's used widely on animals. Oh, what a great thought! <laughs> I boy, I uh, wish you know they put it on birds and whales to see yes, where they go. Why course. wasn't aren't the dogs nowadays wearing oh, carrying satnaps? That I, uh, it makes me wonder why nobody thought of that, especially in a place as desolate as that jungle. I mean, how could you Ooh. Could be? I, now I'm thinking like what kind of, I don't know what kind of wild animals are in there, but snakes and snakes. Uh, they could harm that dog. It's certainly not an environment. It would be a custom. So I'm, I'm worrying about the dog. Okay. Now. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Any other questions for Michelle? I don't know if that's a question or well, someone talking yeah. in the background. Yeah. <laughs> I think someone in the background there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I'll, uh, well, I, it's not really, a, well, it, perhaps it is a question. I, I was interested in the uh, ATA uh, dog listing uh -huh. um, goes down to actual breeds. Goes oh, yeah. That detail. Oh, dear. There's, there's <laughs> a, there are many. Yeah. Uh, I probably have to get uh, 
Oh my! I'll yes. probably have to join and get it. I think you do. You do have to join, but it's a yeah. lovely organization. Yeah. And, um, because so, um, and what I will do is some. I have bought because often you have to buy the whole set. As I noticed, one or two of your first. Yes, you've got the whole set. Um, yeah. Personally, well, um, so I've got quite a few somewhere where I've got a whole set where I've only taken out one. And all this I don't want. So I will have a look if there's a St. Bernard. Oh, do. And and but, I um, will. Um, I'm going to put my yeah. email address in chat. Uh, yeah. In case you or anyone uh, yeah. wants to contact me yeah. to ask questions about that. Hold on. No, yeah. So if you've got any sets where you don't want the Irish setter. <laughs> yes, we all know that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, there's there's my email address, and okay. you. Oh right. Okay. Feel yes. free yeah. to ask me questions. Um, yeah. yeah. About purchasing those online, you do have to. Yeah, you do have now to be. I'll, I'll uh, yes. But oh my gosh, once you get started, and you see how many checklists. M M B. M M B dot. Yeah. Philately at gmail.com. P H I L. Oh, I got spelled wrong. I was trying to talk and type. Wait a minute. It's philately spelled correctly, which I did not do. M M B dot P H I L A T E L Y at gmail.com. There. Yeah. That's better. So, yeah. Michelle, do you get your uh, postal, your yeah. Cinderella items yeah. from the same listing, or do you find those a different way? You know, your postal uh, labels. There, no. Um, the ATA checklists only the contain stamps. postage stamps. Yeah. Yeah, well, and there are few sources. There are no complete catalogs of poster stamps. Um, uh, the recent passing of Charles Kittle uh, in England uh, meets the end of the wonderful uh, catalogs that he provided. And he, uh, his daughter uh, in the ATL. Yeah, ATL. Player is selling his duplicates. He donated his entire collection to the Royal Philatelic uh, Society. But um, so I've chatted with her and I, there, there's a, a seller in Switzerland that is really prolific in offering uh, poster stamps on eBay. Unfortunately, none of the auction titles have any descriptors in them. You can't search by dog, right? Because the title of the auction is Cinderella 4.1. Cinderella 4.2, I'm not making this up. So, so now I get a, an eBay alert for that seller and I have to go through everything they offer and it's usually a hundred a day or more and just look through them. Michael, I see lots of umbrella ones. <laughs> I think of you every time I see a poster sample of an umbrella. I thought, similar problem, similar problem, yeah. He does not want this, but I just, anyway. I, I love poster stamps and I bought several recently. And there's another seller uh, uh, who's an ATA member. He's in Connecticut. Uh, his business is Connecticut Cinderella's and he always offers great information. He'll give you background information about the artist or the, the, the item being presented on the stamp or that kind of thing. Um, and I bought several from him recently simply because the topics were interesting, the stamp was attractive, and I thought any one of these could be a one-page exhibit for uh, BTA, so I'm buying this as a catalyst for a future one-pager. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, oh, there's a British uh, chap on eBay uh, called uh, Red Guy. I don't know if you've ever seen him. Oh, I've bought from him lots yeah. of times. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? So he, he, he just trades as Red Guy. I don't know what his postage is to the states, but um, um, well, I, I, I mean, it's luck whether you find what you want. If, yeah, if, yeah. But uh, well, if he doesn't, if he puts he doesn't... a lot up there. Yeah. Okay. And he's a well, bit overpriced sometimes. In oh. my opinion. <laughs> they all have their, but, uh, their moments, don't they? I, I'd appreciate it if the next time you saw uh, an auction from him, if you would just send me, email me the link, 
so I yeah, could exactly. connect. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in checking him out. Yeah. You can. Well, thank you, all of you, for taking time to listen to the talk and, and for your questions and comments. I appreciate it. And could we all uh, show our appreciation to yeah. Michelle in the yeah. usual manner? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.